I quite like how the film begins with this sweeping wide pan that hones in on Scrat and then regresses to static close-up shots. The filmmakers are telling us they know, after the establishing shot, to just focus on the delightful Scrat. While a lot of his segments hit his peak that began the first film, he's still an absolute delight. Not at the level of the finest Looney Tunes, but close. It can't be overstated how much the Ice Age sequels take place in a different narrative universe than the first film. Even that selling is short. They're in a different cinematic ecosystem entirely. It's like Disney direct-to-video sequels and how different they feel despite being similar. We get used to it only because 80% of this franchise is in this off universe. Over a minute of watching prehistoric extras frolicking in a water park, the migration last time was plot relevant. This is just boring. Take note, filmmakers. You can't make jokes about, uh, male tools when your characters are mauled without them. Forgetting why the piranhas aren't attacking any of these animals, these animals wouldn't play in water with piranhas. What eyes would distort Sid's torso and belly, but not the rest? The scratch segments could pull it off, but outside of those, the film lacks the visual energy needed for such a task. You're supposed to wear blindfolds. Okay. She doesn't even try to cover both her eyes. The tapered chunked mammal here, trust me the scientific name's too much of a mouthful, vanishes and then reappears. I made this herd, so you need to start treating me with some respect. Any hope that the film will be above using the blandest of kid films cliches blandly just evaporated folks. It's not a very satisfying ending. And yet you were not only enchanted, you cheered at the ending. Where's your big happy family? At least the film hasn't forgotten what happened last time. This won't apply down the road, so treasure it while it lasts. The reed is only fully submerged for a second before Stu is to surface. It's not faulty, since it works later. You know a con man is stupid when he thinks he can flog something found commonly in nature. I'm trying to make a living here, pal. Except animals don't need to make a living. They eat food, sleep in shelter, and find a mate. That's it. Your breath smells like ants. <sighs> The filmmakers think contemporary children are unintelligent enough that they need a stupid joke to realise that's an anteater. Dark times we live in. Oh, well what about the dinosaurs? The dinosaurs got cocky. Whether intentional or not, that sequel hint's too obvious now Dawn of the Dinosaurs exists. The ice sheet extends all the way to the horizon. We're supposed to believe that Diego caused it all to shatter. Yeah, no. Look at that, folks. It looks like an ocean's worth of seawater and we're supposed to believe this thin dam of ice is holding up against that weight. How would the tree have climbed such a steep wall? Ain't no way up, folks. The freakishly off model angles of Manny's mouth are back, folks. You're in a bowl. If this valley is a bowl, how did everyone get in? Especially the main trio, who weren't here to begin with. Every sequel does this, moving the characters elsewhere even after they've settled down. You can make it to the end of the valley. There's a boat. It can save you. I don't see anything. He said it was at the valley's end, you idiot. Damn. Yeah, we get it. It's a dam. If children honestly need obvious dialogue to get that, well, let's hope not. The filmmakers put a bit more ice below the water, but still way below the correct amount relative to the amount above. Take it as a given that it fluctuates erratically. Do we have to bring this crap? I'm sure there's crap where we're going. On this side of the Atlantic, that word has stronger implications than in America. Either way, it's a lazy pun. Aside from Manny's shadow not matching his position, Sid's shadow isn't cast despite being right next to him. Where is James? It took this far for him to realize he left the child behind? So there are water passages under most of the valley? Do you buy this? I don't. Nice try, filmmakers. All the camera angle camouflaging in the world can't distract us from Scrat's saber teeth missing here. Something to be commended is how the Scrat sequences differ from film to film in a specific goal. Last time, it was to bury the acorn. Here, it's to get it back, locked in a wily e. coyote system. Glorious stuff. Sometimes I can offer insight on these segments, and sometimes there's no insight to offer. Don't question it, just love it. This is the visually roughest Ice Age film. It's staged enough that the fur fakery, among other things, shows, and the designs are too visually sanitized. It's a meta joke how Diego is stripped of any ability to be savage, fits for a largely useless character, at least Sid's still the comic relief. Diego struggles to keep pace with Manny now. I need to be alone for a while. You go on ahead. I'll catch up. That won't be hard given one's a slot and the other has Parkinson's disease. Um, filmmakers, we came to watch a film. Not to get an advert for the whack-a-mole out in the lobby. 
Them getting tangled doesn't even make sense. Even in a cartoon, actions should seem physically tangible within their own rules, but this tries to pull a fast one. I'm legitimately disgusted, folks. What's more, how are they stuck? The way they're struggling, you'd think their limbs were tied together, but they're not. They could easily wiggle apart with one motion here. That's an oak leaf, falling in a coniferous forest. You don't need to know those terms to tell the leaf doesn't fit with the trees around it. Any reason Manny's reflection isn't distorted by the ripple? I'm all ears. Possum, possum, possum. No two ways about it, the whole Mama thinks she's a possum angle is pretty insipid, even aside from how obvious the resulting story beats are. Blue Sky reused this, making to save the species plotline later in Rio. In both cases, the female has the personality of a doormat. It's perfectly normal for isolated action frames to look off, given the speed, but removing a face from an established model? That's freaky stuff there. Ellie will be the mommy. Thus far, we've only heard Ellie's name when she talked privately to the possums. Guess Manny must be an eavesdropper, folks. I'm not fat. It's this fur that makes me look big. It's poofy. That's an exact quote from last time. It's done slow here, so it's not as funny. You, ma'am, you look like a big, fat, hairy beast. Ooh. How'd you like to lose a ton or two, huh? Would I ever? Well, she's off to a start, shedding your ears between shots. The twig she poorly hides herself with couldn't be seen overhead earlier. Gee, isn't it a coincidence they only have footprints when the plot calls for it? While we're at discrepancies, Manny moves away enough between shots so their shadows don't overlap by their tusks. The reverse happens too. The ice the group walks over is solid here, yet it's thin and transparent later. Given the filmmakers don't even try to play around with nature as an antagonist, we're left with these two as the only peril. They have cool designs, but no personality. As such, they're never tangibly present as a threat. You're gonna have to face your fear sooner or later. Well, as soon as the plot calls for it anyway. At least a flimsy plot like this one. Next to the first film's opening, this is perhaps the most signature scrap moment. We're talking top-notch makes the trailer quality, folks. The piranha that swallowed the acorn was knocked to the right, yet the one scrap retrieves it from is on the opposite side. Oh, scrap. Ellie was much closer to Crash. No way did Eddie get there first. So what's holding you back? My family. You can have that again, you know. No, Sid, I can't. It doesn't rise above sitcom depth, but Manny's dilemma with his past is poignant. Enough to make you wish they tackled it properly, but you take what you get. No strings attached, John Powell's score really works. It's absolutely from the Hans Zimmer school of film music, but it's the only thing that succeeds at the heavy lifting during action and especially emotional scenes. The snow-covered tree is supposed to look like a mammoth, and Ellie's crust when she realizes it isn't, but it's composited poorly enough that the odds of you catching that are slim. Because as far as mammoths go, you're, uh, you know. Manny had a mate before. He should not be experiencing first female encounter awkwardness. As before, it's so lovely how these segments are clearly the result of storyboard development, and not of material from hired external writers. That's how they used to make cartoons before they forgot, after all. Sid's still comic relief, so they rarely need to bring up his respect subplot to justify him existing, but given Diego's uselessness, we keep getting tepid scenes about his fear subplot. Do you realize that now we have a chance to save our species? Really? How are we gonna do that? Well... You know. The only reason they're getting away with this is because they're animals, not humans. Even so, expect the birds and the bees talk, kids. You're not saving a species tonight or any other night. Mammoths don't do it during the daytime, folks. You heard it first here. Given Ellie marched ahead of Manny, how come Manny got back first? <gasps> Watch out, there's a stump. Not anymore. Forgetting they lack modeled, uh, male tools, can anyone actually say they laughed at this and were proud of doing so? Didn't think so. The platform Sid grabs onto is the middle one. It was on the other side before the support rock broke, so it would not have rotated around that far. You just overreacted, that's all. What? Take it back! There are other lives at stake here! The filmmakers take a lazy shortcut in brushing through the makeup dialogue by slapping it on a hastily added action scene. Needless to say, it falls short. I find it hard to believe the loss of Sid's weight from the stack was enough to make it start to topple. Tomorrow's the day the vulture said we're all gonna die. The vulture gave them a three day fuse before the dam burst. This is only night two, so it'll be the day after tomorrow. Either the vultures are on, or the filmmakers are. Take your pick, folks.
It's the mini slot scene more than any that really shows how padded and draggy this film is as a result of its slipshod writing approach. The chief mini slot wasn't on the rock in the overhead shot previously. They set the thing up. They can't be that surprised. They don't imitate that. Why? This sing along lasts about 30 seconds. Guess how many seconds too long that is? Well, we're clearly several different ropes tying Sid up become one long one when he needs to be saved by dumb luck. That actually is a stretch cats do, folks. Who knows if Sabres did, but it's a movement that fits and feels right. When Ellie fell asleep, she was touching the ground, so she shouldn't have been able to fall off screen when she woke here. Can we say how fun this cover of Food Glorious Food is? Doesn't top the Oliver original, but it's a much needed tonic of campy fun. Crash and Eddie go from Ellie's tusks to emerging from behind her ears. I just did something involuntary and messy. Aside from how tasteless that is, Sid's results isn't there. We've established this franchise doesn't have a problem with showing that type of thing. We go forward. We go back. Forward. Back. A plot mandated nature obstacle got them back together. The same split them up again. Nature is as nature does, folks. The geysers have been going off continuously every few seconds for the past minute, yet they relent briefly here for the purpose of an okay gag. Gee, isn't it fortunate they didn't hurt Manny much? Diego actually seemed to be going faster than Manny here, then he teleports back behind Sid. What a surprise. At a first glimpse of the boat path, the queue was on an uphill point. Here, it is regressed back to the dip nearer the start. Did it really take Scrat half a day to try and scale the vulture's nest again? He's too persistent to patiently wait. The water animation, much like the ice and snow, is dully adequate. Except here. Doesn't give the flood character, but it really illustrates its power. The first place flooded is where Manny pondered, as proven by the stalactites. Yet that was a day into the journey. The filmmakers lazily reuse sets throughout the flood without thinking where they logically belong. This tape here trunked babble is following in the kid's footsteps. That one vanished, this one changes colour. When a film puts its only female character in a situation where she requires rescue, that's another issue on top of said rescue plot's flimsiness. Look at how slow Diego is running compared to Manny, he's barely faster than Sid. More proof, if it was needed, of how he doesn't matter anymore. The flood deluges the valley where Ellie played dead. That was halfway through the trek at best, yet we're supposed to believe it's flooded after the water reaches visibility here. Shoddy set reuses shoddy. The characters often look clunky and move stiffly. These moments make it clear the blue sky began as an effect house, not an animation studio. The water level here hasn't reached the baseline for where Ellie's trapped, yet in the next shot, it's rising on the inside as though it is. The possums go from one holding by the arms and the other by the tail to both by the arms. They're not strong enough to reel them in for one to swap. Most animals can swim as babies, you know. Yeah, but not tigers. I left that part out. Unless children have regressed more than I care to know in the last decade, even they know tigers are adept swimmers from birth, and that's how the filmmakers try to pull a fast one with this subplot. Ellie, hold on to me. It goes by too quickly to really resonate, but the fact that Manny would have held Ellie to the end is touching enough, folks. These two are quicker swimmers than Manny, so how, after being close, they ended up far away enough from him is a mystery for the ages. The group was looking off the ledge's high point here, Guess which way they're looking two shots later? The only other piece of land left is the one supporting the boat. In all the earlier shots, there wasn't anywhere else nearly as high as it. So, no. The path of holes Scrat left in his wake wasn't scow shot like that. Pretty much straight, as it happens. Remind yourself, folks, just how much water is behind the dam. We're supposed to believe it would all drain out this gap, as though there's more room there than here. It took eight minutes to flood the valley to this level. Guess how long it takes to drain? It's not a time lapse, we can see it draining at a faster pace. Thus, to absolutely no one's surprise, the actual meltdown, the thing the title, is barely more than an afterthought. That dumb Beale family pushed that excrement all away? Yeah, no. Either they found this near the boat, or this is a different family entirely and the first one perished. Take your pick, folks. Gee, isn't it funny how we didn't see one mini slot in any of the crowd shots during the boarding? He made this hurt. We'd be nothing. Without him. Limb structure be darned, Sid's still likable enough for that to be rewarded. Look at how many mini slots are here. Guess how many are in the overhead shot later?
On the one hand, the film expectedly cheats out of them being the only ones left. On the other hand, this is one of the few genuinely rousing moments, mostly, again, due to the score, but that doesn't dismiss it. The puddle that's right next to those four vanishes in the close-up. Okay, that paraphrase from the first film works. I still have my pride, you know. No, you don't, Diego. Stop kidding yourself. I'm not annoyed for Manny needing our push to get over his past, but for them to pretend Manny's gonna leave them to go with Ellie, only for them to keep us a six mammal herd moments later, pure lazy. If I had a dog, and my dog had a kid, and the dog's kid had a pet, that would be sick. Whether the sequel hint is intentional or not, there's only so much we can take of the other slagging Sid when they're supposed to love him. And who should come along to save us from an especially draggy denouement, but Scrat, just in time too. Scrat adds five acorns to two here, yet he only has six after the fact. Heaven can't handle math, folks. You saw first here. Must be too satanic. Some of Scrat's segments, especially in the later films, heavily use excerpts of famous classical music. Works. Just when the crowds had the filmmakers' kids' drawings on their side, they shove in the mini slot song that's bound to send anyone in double digits away. When you get down to it, the film functions like a subpar short collection, some highlights, but mostly dreary clinkers, doesn't leave an impression. Minus 83. Gosh, this film is some of the longest 83 minutes ever. It's not bad, just crushingly mediocre. <laughs> 